What's up bitches and hoes, this is Ozzy Kurar's Top 10 Greatest Anythings Ever of 2011 in LPW. Now, I want to make one thing very clear, the only reason I am not numbers 1 through 10 is because the fascist bastards at LPW management told me I couldn't do it. So let's go. Number 10. Who hit Jude Maxwell? It was insanity live at Memphis when Jude Maxwell was run down by a speeding car, prompting the return of magic to try to figure out who could have done it. At first, Magic thought the anarchists were responsible, and in fact, they actually didn't really seem particularly enthusiastic to deny the charge. Eventually, Magic would actually attack them at all costs, only to eventually find out that it wasn't them when Nigel Vanderbilt would come forward and confess to the crime, purely because he felt like it. We're not quite sure why Nigel would actually hit him, and we're not quite sure what the future's going to hold in terms of the you know, consequences for Nigel Vanderbilt, but uh, next year is still young. Number 9, holy shit, what a year for Deshaun J. Connery. First he wins the Trash Talker of the Year award for 2010, then he wins the Phoenix Cup, giving the title shot and the trophy to a returning Eddie B in exchange for money he said he needed for his family. Eddie B would pay him the money, as well as a savage beating that we thought would keep DJC out of LPW forever. This was not to be, as DJC would later return to cost Eddie B a six-man elimination TLC title match for the International Heavyweight Championship. DJC, on the other hand, would be rewarded with a shot at the vacant Western States Heavyweight Championship, which he would eventually lose to Sean Jensen. That's where we leave it so far, but to say we leave it so far would be a bit of a misnomer. Number 8, one that's very near and dear to my heart, the Master of the Asylum Tournament. It would kick off in Atlantic City with a series of four eight-man tags, during which yours truly picked up his first victory by pinning Sean Jensen. The next week, at Insanity Gold, it would continue as a battle royale, narrowing it down to eight men who would proceed in a fairly basic single elimination tournament. At the Madness, it would conclude as finalists Drew Michaels and Mass Chaos faced off, with Mass Chaos eventually coming out the victor and becoming one night only general manager of Insanity. And what a show that was. Number seven, the creation of the LPW Pure Wrestling Championship. After Atlas Adams joined the Anarchists and left for the Insanity brand, bringing along with him the television title, Pyromania was left without a third tier championship. Thus was conceived the LPW Pure Wrestling title, which would be contested in 10 minute matches with the rules strictly enforced. The first champion was Jeff Watson, who would defeat Kaiser Kidd, who had actually won the number one contendership in the television title back when it was a Pyromania exclusive championship. Jeff Watson would hold the title for one show before listening to the mighty Dino Might, who would go on to defend against such stars as Aldous Gregory, Steve Monroe, and the former champion himself, Jeff Watson, who he would actually defeat in an MMA match. Number six, the amazing, if occasionally bizarre and somewhat twisted comeback here of Ken Ryans. Ken Ryans would return, cashing in an old guaranteed world title shot to win the International Heavyweight Championship by defeating Styx at Honor Roll. The very next show, he would defend again against Black Reaper, and at one-way ticket, he would technically retain in an astonishing six-man elimination TLC match for the title, also featuring Tromboner Man, Ultra Marcus, Eddie B, Styx, and Drew Michaels. The match would come down to the final two, which were Ken Ryans and Tromboner Man, at which point neither man would be able to continue. The following show he would lose the title of Tromboner Man in a one-on-one -on -one match before declaring that he really had no intention of cashing in his rematch clause immediately as he kind of intended to climb the card again first. He would then engage in a short feud with Ultramarcus, during which Ultramarcus would attack him, giving him amnesia. He would then engage in a short feud with Seth Omega, and to date has not regained his memory. Speaking of Seth Omega, he's our number five, with a year that could only be described as a good old-fashioned anarchist uprising with the people. First, he was voted in by the people to have a World Heavyweight Championship shot at the Madness. It would not come easy, though, as on his way he would lose to the rabbi, adding the rabbi to the world title match, which would ultimately be as undoing as the champion, Morpheus, would actually pin the rabbi to keep the title. Shortly thereafter, Seth Omega would attack Team Insanity during a match against Team Pyromania, defecting to the Pyromania brand, which he has thus far failed to actually secure a contract for. 2012 could very well be the year of Seth Omega, and what does it hold? We'll find out. Number four, holy fuck, the feud between Nigel Vanderbilt and Andy Savannah. It all began when Andy Savannah screwed Vanderbilt out of a match at Honor Roll, before the next night Vanderbilt would declare that he knew the reason Savannah was acting this way and it was because he was dying. Vanderbilt then proclaimed himself the only man who could afford to pay for Savannah's medical treatment, only on the condition that Savannah now belonged to him. Andy had absolutely no choice but to comply, and it cost him an embarrassing lay-down victory at at all costs. Vanderbilt would then intensify the feud by kidnapping Andy Savannah's girlfriend, Whore. It was at that point that the feud got a hell of a lot more awesome when the guy with two thumbs and a bucket load of kick-ass joined this guy. I took exception to the way Nigel Vanderbilt was treating Whore, and trust me, I would know a lot about how to treat a Whore. Nigel Vanderbilt would ultimately punish me for my... talking by eliminating me from a battle royale and the master of the Asylum Tournament. It was not over for Andy Savannah in the tournament, as he decided that winning this tournament was probably a better idea than relying on Vanderbilt for the cash. The feud would seemingly come to an end in the latter match, in which Whore 
all the money for Andy's treatment, and the United States Championship Andy had recently picked up from Mass Chaos were all on the line in a ladder match. Andy would ultimately grab the championship, also winning the money and the return of Whore, and costing Nigel Vanderbilt an eye in the process. However, only a few shows later, Vanderbilt would come to the ring to present Andy Savannah with the money. As soon as Savannah signed that the money had in fact been delivered to him, Vanderbilt lit the bag on fire. As Vanderbilt looks to return to the ring in 2012, he may have proved himself to be, if not the most evil, most certainly, and I do hate to say this, one of the smartest men in LPW. And the only reason we haven't seen him with a world title around his waist may be that he would just be bored with it. Number three, the stable wars that have dominated much of the LPW card throughout the year. It's really the story of three stables, Prophecy of Violence, the Australies, and Apocalypse. Prophecy of Violence started out the year as a three-man stable consisting of brothers tag team Daniel Pleasant and Michael Stone, and a leader who put the loose and loosely affiliated Sean Jensen. They were feuding with the hardcore degenerates who they'd eventually join up with after dropping Michael Stone. The group probably made the biggest impact of the year at Inferno 18.3 when on one night Dick Dynamo made Sheepster tap out and the entire stable would gang up to hand Sean Jensen the Western States Heavyweight Championship. And meanwhile there was the Australis. Styx and Cripsy would form an alliance by attacking Dr. Wagner, saying that they were tired of Australians being held down in LPW. Zenith and Captain Crossbones Cafu would later be added as members, attacking Sheepster under masks. This would actually all be revealed as part of the plan, as Styx would reveal that it was actually basically Sheepster he was talking about when he said he was sick of Australians being held down, as Sheepster had been handed shot after shot after shot at title after title after title, while Styx had had to claw his way to every shot he got. Meanwhile, on the insanity side, the pay-per-view at all costs would prove to be a very good show for a certain number of people. Not only would X defeat Phantom Lord in a steel cage, but Ash Strife would win the United States Championship in a last man standing match, and Eric Scorpio would be revealed as the general manager of insanity. Along with Cyanide, later that night they would form the aptly dubbed alliance, Apocalypse. And then things kind of started to run together a bit. Sean Jensen would challenge the Australians to a six-man tag featuring the other three members of his own stable against three members of theirs. Shortly thereafter, Apocalypse would extend an open invitation to Sean Jensen to join them anytime he liked. Then at Sacrificial Creed, Sean Jensen would tap out to Justice, losing the Western States Heavyweight Championship and attacking Ryan James after the match. That same night, the rest of his stable would earn a victory over the Australia's team consisting of Cripsy, Crossbones, Cafu, and Zenith. And then at the madness, things really started to go to shit. First, the Prophecy of Violence team consisting of Dick Dynamo and Matt Clark, formerly known as the Hardcore Degenerates, would lose their tag team title shot to the Apocalypse team of the Wise Men consisting of X and Ash Strife, who were already tag team champions. After the match, Sean Jensen would come out, brutalize his former teammates, and lock them in caskets before pushing them off the stage. The next night, Dick Dynamo alongside Ryan James would beat the holy hell out of Sean Jensen, while Matt Clark, who was trying to maintain that they should woo Jensen back, was hospitalized by the debuting Christian Parks. The very next week, the Australians proved they weren't quite done yet, as not only did Zenith defeat X for the Hardcore Championship, but Styx regained the Western States Heavyweight Championship that new Apocalypse member Sean Jensen had earlier lost to Justice. This is where things stand now, but I'm sure they're not over. Number two, the somewhat astonishing World Championship reign of Morpheus, who would win the LPW World Heavyweight Championship by defeating Sheepster in the Prairie Capital Center before being stranded in Japan due to the tsunami. Not only would he persevere through these conditions, but he would return to American soil to retain the title against Cynical at Insanity Gold before retaining it again against the rabbi and the ever-popular and ever-hated Seth Omega at the Madness. Shortly after that, he would go on to form the somewhat enigmatic stable The Awakened, and as of yet, he has not lost the title. And number one, what the fuck else did you think it was? The feud between Tromboner Man and Drew Michaels. When Tromboner Man returned, he seemingly had only one man on his mind, and that was Drew Michaels. Along the way, he would pick up the Western States Heavyweight Championship before being stripped by Drew Michaels for acting crazy. The very same night he was stripped of the Western States Heavyweight Championship, he would go on to win the International Heavyweight Championship by defeating Ken Ryans, only for the revelation that would possibly change LPW forever. D. Hammond Samuels returned for one night only to reveal that it was actually Drew Michaels who had the idea to send Trom Motorman away in the Australian Army. Drew Michaels maintained that he did what he had to do as the ensuing chaos from the enlistment allowed Damien Cross to perform a hostile takeover on LPW, saving it from D. Hammond Samuels. And that's where things got weird. The next week, Drew Michaels would shift his story a little bit, saying that he didn't just do it for the sake of LPW, he did it because he wanted to see Trom Motorman grow up. He referred to him as an underachieving man-child, not that there's anything wrong with that, who hadn't really accomplished anything in his time in LPW so far, and that since returning from the army, he'd won two championships and couldn't have done that without the toughening up that the army gave him. He would further drive this point home by beating Trombone Man with his own trombone, which in the eyes of many, including myself, may have been the point he crossed the line. Things between the two would end forever in a horrifically bloody Tijuana Steel cage match, 
in which Trombone Man would not only retain his International Heavyweight Championship and his pride, but he would strip Drew Michaels of his Insanity General Manager status. And that's the year we've had in LPW so far. Join me next year when the number one will of course be the World Heavyweight title around my shoulder. I'm Ossie Krirar, and this year did not suck balls.